Hi class, welcome to lesson one of unit five, and this is the lecture where I talk about Andrew Jackson's presidency and its impact on the United States. And honestly, Andrew Jackson, uh, like him or hate him, is one of the most impactful presidents in American history. And I'll talk about his effect on the country. I'll talk about the major events that happened in the United States during his presidency. Uh, and before I get into that, I will talk a little bit uh, about his personality and a little bit about his personal history because it is interesting. I've told you some already. I'll tell you a little bit more. The reason for doing so is because you, you need to have an idea of just how tough and how no-nonsense this man is. It really plays into his presidency. And keep that in mind that a, a president's personality does play into how they behave as president. So he had grown up having to kind of fend for himself. He had been an orphan by age 13. Well, during the Re American Revolution, he was in North Carolina at the time, or in the North Carolina, South Carolina border area. And at the age of 13, he was captured by a British general. Remember, the British had invaded the South during the American Revolution. And this 13-year-old Andrew Jackson is going to be ordered by a general of the, of the British military to clean the mud off his boots. And Jackson, as a 13-year-old, will say no to a general in the most powerful military in the world. This general gets angry. He takes out his saber. He slashes Andrew Jackson across the face with it, leaves him with a lifelong scar. But Jackson, even at the age of 13, uh, well, one, he never cleans the boot. But number two, he shows his toughness. One other example of his toughness is his his uh, when it relates to his personal uh, sense of loyalty, his personal sense of honor. If you disrespected him, he was probably going to challenge you to a duel. He was in multiple duels in his life. The most famous one was one where he felt disrespected by a man. Uh, and actually, during the duel, let the other man shoot first. And then apparently the man missed because Jackson didn't move after the first man shot. Jackson proceeded to take his gun and shoot and kill the opponent, even though dueling was illegal by this point. Now, what's interesting to note is that Jackson had, in fact, been hit by a bullet. He had been hit in the chest, and the musket ball was within, I think, an inch of his heart, maybe even closer, and he was bleeding, yet he did not let on that he was hurt. By the end of his life, he had four, I believe it was four musket balls in his body that he carried in his body. It frequently gave him lead poisoning, which made him sick. Uh, however, that gives you a sense of how tough he was. And, of course, you know that he is a hero from the Battle of New Orleans. You know that he was a hero even though he did some shady things in Florida. He was a hero for helping the United States obtain Florida. So, going into his presidency, people knew that if Andrew Jackson said something, even if it wasn't popular, he was going to back it up. He was a very, very tough president. I would argue the toughest president we've ever had. So, uh, you'll see how his personality plays into things later on. Now, real quickly, I'll address the essential idea. Uh, his presidency will involve or will represent a sort of new democracy, a, a democracy of the common man. Again, the Jacksonian period is oftentimes seen as the era of the common man. And he himself was from common origins, had worked his way up from being an orphan at age 13. And uh, again, uh, he ushers in this common man era, and I told you about how his inaugural White House party kind of symbolized that in the last lecture. I'm going to go through how the common man era is kind of represented during and after his presidency. Then I'll go through the three major events of his presidency, the nullification crisis, the Indian Removal Act, which led to the Trail of Tears, and his famous bank war. After that, I will go quickly into the next uh, uh, presidents, ele uh, the, the president that comes in after him, Martin Van Buren. Uh, I'll quickly talk about how unsuccessful his presidency is. Then I'll talk about the election of 1840, which represents another kind of common man election, which involved a lot of campaigning and, and mudslinging, things like that. Okay, so let's move forward. There are several, if you will, identifying qualities of Jacksonian democracy, or this era of the common man. 
One thing that you'll note by looking at the chart here on the left is that in the years following the, the rise of the common man and the universal white male suffrage, you will see voting participation go uh, to very high levels. In fact, in a few elections, uh, voter participation among eligible voters is 80%. Today, it's closer to 50 to 55%. So people were really participating in government back then. And one reason was because the common man suddenly could vote. So the first kind of aspect of Jacksonian democracy will be universal white male suffrage. Suddenly, you did not have to be wealthy to vote. Did you still have to be white? Did you still have to be male? Yes, but you did not have to have vast amounts of property to be able to vote. And suddenly, the common man is able to vote. And as you can see from the chart, they vote in very high numbers, much more than you would see today. So again, the government is going to start representing the desires of the common or average or poor white male. This is the time, for example, when you start to see debtor's prisons go away because poor white males tended to be victims of debtor's prison. Uh, so once the common man is able to vote, you're going to see politicians start passing laws that favor them. Another aspect of Jacksonian democracy will be the use of different ways of getting elected president or different ways of getting elected to any elected position. Uh, different tactics being used, like campaigning. When I say campaigning, I mean that you have to go around and make speeches, you have to shake people's hands, you have to meet them face to face, kiss their babies, uh, make yourself seem more like a common person. You want to appeal and seem more average. Even if you are a very wealthy American, you want to come off as one of the more common people. And uh, that really appeals to common Americans, this idea of campaigning. Today, politicians campaign relentlessly to the point where they almost annoy people with how many commercials they put on the TV and the Internet. Something that goes hand in hand with campaigning is a negative form of, form of campaigning known as mudslinging. And mudslinging is whenever, rather than promoting yourself, you attack your enemy. You talk about how bad your enemy is, or enemy might be a strong word, but your opponent. Uh, so you talk junk about your opponent. And sometimes if you're really good at saying bad things about your opponent, that helps you look better by comparison and helps you get elected president. So those are things that really appeal to the common people. And so from here on out, you will see can, uh, candidates campaigning and sometimes negatively campaigning through mudslinging. Another thing that you'll see with the rise of the common man will be the spoil system. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people refer to this with the word patronage, but for the sake of this class, spoil system will be fine. Uh, and basically what the spoil system does is it rewards people for giving political support. And so what Andrew Jackson did is if you campaigned on his behalf, you could count possibly on getting a federal government job as a result of your political loyalty. You got rewarded for your political loyalty with a government job. And by the way, in every single town in this country, there is a federal government job available that would be working for the United States Postal Service, so working for the post office. So basically in every corner of the country, even in the smallest of towns, you will see people that will suddenly get involved in politics, uh, common people that had never been involved in politics, if for no other reason because they hope to get rewarded politically later on by getting a government job, again, possibly working for the Postal Service. Obviously, the system could get corrupt and get, get corrupt pretty quickly because suddenly you could get a job, not because you earned the job, not because you were uh, deserving of the job or qualified the job for the job, but simply because you supported the candidate that won. For example, you would see people getting uh, jobs at the post office that couldn't read and write, but they got the job because they had supported the candidate that won. So this system is going to get corrupted pretty quickly. Overall, however, what you see is the rise of common white males. Again, not every group is going to be represented during this period, but common white male Americans suddenly see more power and more influence than they had ever seen before. There's going to be a man that's going to come in from France uh, named Alexis de Tocqueville. And what Alexis de Tocqueville is going to do is he's going to write an enormously long book that I will never read, uh, but I can give you the main idea of it. 
It's a very, very thick book. Uh, and what he does is he basically comments on what is different about the United States. And remember, this is during this time period after the War of 1812 where the United States is starting to kind of create an independent new identity. And one of these, the aspects of this new identity is that there is more equality among different classes of people. You don't see as much difference between the rich and the poor as you would see, say, as you would in Europe. Now, there was obviously still difference, uh, and there was still such thing as the status of being rich and people not wanting to be poor, but the difference was less striking than you might see in Europe. For example, in the United States, when people were riding on steamboats, both the rich and the poor were allowed to freely walk around upon the deck of the steamboat. The poor didn't have to stay in one area, and the rich got to stay in another area. Whenever you had a job, you might refer to your boss as a boss, whereas in Europe you might call them your master. So there are these little things that Alexis de Tocqueville saw that represented more equality between different groups of Americans. In fact, one of the, this is kind of interesting. One of the other things he noticed was that in the United States, children would often eat at the same table as their parents. And in Europe, that was not always the case. So again, overall, Alexis de Tocqueville is going to see more equality in the United States, that, and that's one of the things that defines the United States as being different from Europe at this time. Now, that being said, there were definite limits on Jacksonian democracy. If you were black, if you were female, if you were Native American, you are not going to be treated equally. You are not going to be given a voice in government. Uh, blacks are not are going to be discriminated against even in states where slavery is illegal. Oftentimes they cannot vote even if they were free blacks in the northern states. Obviously, if they're in the south, they're very likely to be slaves. And if they're slaves, they're considered property and they get no voting whatsoever or no freedom whatsoever. Women were also very limited. Uh, women, if they owned property at this point, if they got married, uh, their property, even if they had plenty of property that they had inherited, the property went to uh, the man that they married. Women could not vote. So in this era of the common man, it's very accurate to call it the common man because women were left out. And eventually women are going to start to push back and you will see the beginning of the women's rights movement. And women, above all else, are going to be seeking the right to vote so that the government will uh, represent their needs as well. Native Americans, as has already been established multiple times, are not going to be treated equally. They're not going to be treated as citizens. They're not going to be given the right to vote, even though they had, and their ancestors had been here longer than anybody of European descent. So again, there are limits on Jacksonian democracy, but it does represent an advancement for the, uh, the white males. It does represent an advancement for those that don't have a lot of money and property. So again, even though... Uh, let's rewind. Remember that initially you had to be white and male and have lots of property. Now the property requirement is going to go away. Eventually in American history, the quality of, of us being of a certain sex goes away and women get the right to vote. And you do see multiple women's rights movements, especially in uh, American history too. And eventually you will see slavery abolished. You will see black equality given. Uh, those are events that happen at the end of American one and more so in American history too. But uh, you're at least starting to see this idea of democracy being only for the elite kind of being peeled back and you're seeing democracy being offered to more groups of people over time. So at this point, the, if you will, property requirement goes away, but there is still the requirement to be male. There is still the requirement to be white. Okay. Moving on to Jackson's presidency. Let's see how tough this guy is. I've already kind of played up his toughness. Well, whenever Andrew Jackson takes over as president, and by the way, that's not a picture of him. That's a picture of his vice president, John C. Calhoun. As Jackson enters office, a new tariff has been passed, and this tariff is so unpopular in South Carolina that it earns the nickname the Tariff of Abomination. Sometimes it's nicknamed the Yankee Tariff. And South Carolina especially hated this tariff because remember that the southern states, when they sent out products to Europe, these European countries punished the United States with tariffs of their own. 
And remember, South Carolina is where one of the biggest exporting southern cities exists, that being Charleston. South Carolinians were so mad about this tariff that some of them actually threatened to secede from the United States. In other words, they threatened to break away from the United States and form their own little country. And that's worth noting because uh, many of you already know this, but whenever the Civil War begins, the first, or, or right before the, the Civil War begins, the first southern state to secede or withdraw from the United States, or at least claim to be doing so, will be South Carolina. Now, what's interesting is that when it comes to this tariff, Andrew Jackson was not the biggest fan of tariffs, but he's just come into office, and he doesn't like the idea. Remember, he is now the head of the executive branch. He's representing the federal government now, and even though overall he believes in states' rights, he also does not believe in states being able to leave the Union, and he really doesn't like the idea of his authority to enforce this tariff being questioned. He probably wanted to make a strong impression that he was going to enforce the law, and so what he does is he says to the South Carolinians, oh, you're going to have to abide by this tariff. Now, what's interesting is that as vice president, again pictured here on the right, John C. Calhoun, where was he from? He was from South Carolina. And so his uh, vice president is in a tight spot here. So what John C. Calhoun is going to do is he will suggest, instead of seceding from the United States, let's go back to something, another idea that was experimented with earlier. Let's do nullification instead of secession. Now, if you remember during the Alien and Sedition Acts, whenever President John Adams was in office, his own vice president, Thomas Jefferson, had suggested the nullification of the federal law, the Alien and Sedition Acts. And here you see a repeat of history. Oftentimes, history repeats itself, or at least rhymes, and this is one of those cases. Andrew Jackson's own vice president, John C. Calhoun, suggested he tried to do it kind of secretly. Ultimately, everyone knew that he was the one that had suggested this. He suggested nullification. So here you see, again, the issue of nullification come up. The idea that states can reject a law that they don't agree with. Now, overall, Andrew Jackson is going to be in favor of states' rights. He was a Democrat. He was actually also from South Carolina. Uh, but he also is going to have a condition on believing in states' rights. He does not believe in states' rights in all cases, and this will not be one of them, especially since South Carolina has threatened to secede. I'll talk more about that in a moment. By the way, John C. Calhoun will end up resigning as vice president, and Andrew Jackson will regret that he didn't get a chance to kill John C. Calhoun, which is just like Andrew Jackson to say something like this. So this is the second time that nullification has come up. The third time that it comes up in 1860 will be the time of the Civil War. So we see uh, we can kind of have one foot in the past by kind of reaching back to uh, the or stepping back to the uh, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions and all that, how that related to the Alien Sedition Acts back in the late 1790s. But we can also, with this crisis, have a foot in the future stepping towards the Civil War, which also represented this tension between states and the federal government. Okay, so looking at the notes so that we don't get confused, follow the arrows going to the right-hand side first, then we will move down to the Venn diagram. So let's go from left to right. Let's talk about the webster hain debates. So nullification has uh, shown its, its face for the second time, and this time senators in the U.S. Senate are going to debate whether or not nullification should even be a thing whether it should be allowed. And you'll have two major senators. You'll have one senator named Daniel Webster. I believe he's the one that's shown speaking here uh, on the right-hand side. I'm not positive, but I think he is. And his position, he was from Massachusetts, so he was a northerner. He, I believe, I'm pretty sure he was a Whig. He would believe that the federal government should have more power. So does he believe that the state should be able to violate federal laws like the tariff? No. So he is against nullification. He says that the interest of the Union, or the United States, the federal government, 
should come before the individual states' rights. In fact, he's going to say, look what happened whenever we gave the states too much power. We had the Articles of Confederacy. We almost fell apart. So Daniel Webster is going to make strong arguments against nullification. So this is a big deal. This is being debated hotly in the Senate at this point. A senator from South Carolina named Robert Hayne, you can anticipate what his position will be, and his position will be in favor of nullification. He says that freedom is more important than anything else, and the freedom of the state should come before the United States as a whole. John C. Calhoun is going to agree with this. And in a sense, this actually even relates to compact theory. Uh, remember this idea that the government should represent uh, the people, and if it doesn't represent the people, the rights of the people, then you should get rid of that federal government. Well, in a sense, his argument, Robert Haynes' argument, is going to say that the federal government should represent the natural rights of the states. And if these states' rights aren't being respected, then they have a right to break away from it. And actually, in 1860, when South Carolina does secede from the Union, they will basically make that argument that they entered into the United States uh, on the condition that the United States would respect the rights of the individual states. So you see, again, this, this kind of intellectual argument for seceding from the Union, or at least nullifying federal laws. Uh, I'm probably getting a little too long-winded on that now. Hopefully you got, uh, could follow that. If not, don't worry too much about it. Just know that right now you have people that believe that the United States' needs should come first and they're against nullification. People like Robert Hayne from South Carolina and other Southerners are for nullification, just like Jefferson and Madison had been beforehand uh, during the times of the Alien and Sedition Acts. What about Andrew Jackson? He's the president. Andrew Jackson overall believed in states' rights. The exception to this would be if it created disunion. If an issue was so divisive that it could break up the United States, then he would be in favor of the federal government and he would be against nullification. So he was for nullification. He favored states' rights unless he felt like it was at the point of breaking up the states. And at this point, remember, South Carolina had already threatened to secede from the United States. Now, ultimately, they don't, but they had already made the threat, and Jackson knew it. So, we're going to need a compromise over this tariff. So, in this Venn diagram, uh, go to the left-hand side first, where it says South Carolina's action. Then we'll go to the right-hand side and see Jackson's reaction, and then we'll see how the two sort of came to a compromise deal at the end. Again, Jackson, in this case, will be against nullification because he feels like it's going to break up the Union. Now, he is going to favor states' rights if he thinks that it will not break up the Union, and you'll see that happen with the Indian Removal Act a little bit later on. Okay, so left-hand side first. Oh, there's our old friend, Henry Clay. We will talk about his, his involvement in this event in a moment. So, in the end, South Carolina officially decides to nullify the tariff of abomination. So here, for the first time, a state hasn't just talked about nullification. They've actually gone through with it and said, we're not going to have anything to do with this tariff. So on to the right-hand side. What's Jackson's reaction going to be? He is going to call this treasonous. He is going to threaten to take warships out of the harbor of New York City at least one, maybe more, take them down to South Carolina, and if necessary, blow Charleston off the map. He even says that he's going to go down to Charleston himself. And if he goes down to Charleston and anyone even says the word nullification to him, he says, quote, I will hang the man with the nearest rope that I can find to the nearest tree. So he threatened to, by hand, execute anybody that said even the word nullification to him. Now, given his background and given his personality, if Jackson says this, he means this. And so someone's going to have to come up with some sort of compromise or else Jackson might actually blow a city off the map using the U.S. military. So let's go to the middle. Henry Clay will come up with a compromise to help ease this conflict. So again, Henry Clay the so-called Great Compromiser, will propose the Compromise Tariff of 1833, 
And what Congress does is they lower these tariffs associated with the tariff of abominations to a point that is low enough to satisfy South Carolina. South Carolina won't be happy about this, but they won't be so mad that they're going to do this nullification thing. In the end, South Carolina backs down, which was a smart move whenever you're confronted with someone like Andrew Jackson. Now, another law that gets passed around this time is going to be the force bill, which will authorize the president to use the military to enforce laws like tariffs. So whether or not Jackson taking a warship down to South Carolina would have been legal at the time, the force bill is going to make such an action legal from here on out. By the way, Andrew Jackson was known for sometimes doing something whether or not it was legal and then waiting for people to discuss its legality later on. He was the type that would, uh, if you will, he'd be more willing to uh, ask for forgiveness than he would for permission, although honestly he probably would ask for neither. He would do what he wanted or he felt needed to be done and then let other people fight over whether or not it should have been done. Andrew Jackson was not one to mess with. So what are the future implications of this? This really does foreshadow the coming of the Civil War because in 1860, South Carolina is going to be extremely upset with the election results of the presidential election, and many southern states will be upset, and they will be uh, upset because they don't even put Abraham Lincoln on the southern states' ballots, and yet he still wins the election because he basically gets all the northern states and all the western states. And so in 1860, South Carolina is going to nullify, if you will, the election of Abraham Lincoln, and they will secede from the Union. By the end of 1860, before Lincoln has taken office, uh, South Carolina will have seceded from the Union by early 1861. By the time Lincoln has been sworn into office, you'll have a total of, I believe, seven states that have seceded from the Union. And so the question is, can the president, can Congress, can the federal government use force to enforce laws? For example, can they use force to keep states from seceding or breaking away from the Union? And in the end, the force bill kind of gives that authorization, and the Civil War will start when Abraham Lincoln decides to use military force to preserve the Union. And notice that I put that there, and that is on purpose. Lincoln's number one mission in the Civil War will be to preserve the United States, to keep states from breaking away from the federal government. Now, a lot of people say that the war is fought to uh, end slavery. Now, ultimately, the war does contribute to the ending of slavery, but that is never mission number one for Abraham Lincoln. Mission number one is always preserving the Union. If it requires keeping slavery for a while, he'll say, so be it. Uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation, he'll kind of add ending slavery as a second mission but mission number one is always to preserve the Union. Now, the next question, and then I'll move on, is why did the southern states secede? The southern states, if you read their, their reasons for seceding, overwhelmingly their reason was to keep slavery. But the fighting of the war, the use of military force by Lincoln, is always to preserve the Union. And that's uh, something I'll talk about more later on. So why the southern states secede later on is over slavery largely, but why does Lincoln actually fight this war? It was to preserve the Union, uh, regardless of why the states were leaving. His goal was to preserve the Union. So I, I did a lot of foreshadowing there. Now I'll move on uh, and, and come back to Andrew Jackson. And I'll come to his most controversial action as president, one of the most controversial presidential actions in American history. And that will be the Indian Removal Act. Now, Andrew Jackson whenever he was running for president, pledged to basically move Native Americans out of the eastern part of the United States all of the way west of the Mississippi River. And the idea was that if he did so, then that would open up the settlement of everything east of the Mississippi River to whites. And I think he actually wanted to go a little bit beyond that, actually beyond Missouri all the way to Oklahoma in that area. 
So when Andrew Jackson was running for president, one of the big things that he promoted was the removal of Native Americans. Now, if you look at the cartoon here, it, it, again, Jackson's kind of hard to evaluate. He's kind of a mixed bag. He saw himself almost like a father figure to Native Americans. In fact, he adopted at least one, I think two Native Americans as sons of his own. So his relationship with Native Americans is complicated. And if you were to ask him why he authorizes the removal of Native Americans, he would say, well, whites are going to take over the eastern part of the country anyway. If I move the Native Americans out west, it'll keep them safe from white conflict. Of course, the Trail of Tears was a very awful thing that resulted from this law. I'll talk more about this later on. But Andrew Jackson's relationship is, is kind of complicated with Native Americans, especially as shown in this cartoon. But overall, if he is a father to uh, the Native American people, a father figure, he's not a very good one. So whenever he becomes president, shortly after he becomes president, Congress is going to pass the Indian Removal Act of 1830, and it's going to authorize the military to move all Native Americans that are east of the Mississippi River into the Great Plains well past the Mississippi River, out to the Oklahoma area. And I have a map that I'll show you in a moment that kind of shows that. And a lot of Native Americans are going to do this, and they're not going to be able to put up much resistance. Uh, the army is going to come in and force them to move. Uh, but the one Native American group that is going to resist the most will be the Cherokee. Now the Cherokee are going to be one of the Native American groups that had done the most to kind of line themselves up with white American culture. Uh, they had written uh, their own constitution. They basically occupied a kind of mini country called the Cherokee Nation within Georgia and they had written their own form of government. Uh, they were farmers. Some of them even owned slaves slaves. So they basically had done all sorts of things to kind of blend in with the surrounding white population. A lot of them have even converted to Christianity. So culturally, they had become very similar to the southern whites. But there's a problem, and that is that the people of Georgia realize that the section of Georgia that belonged to the Cherokee had gold on it, and the Georgia state government wanted that gold. And so there's going to be a Supreme Court case, and the Supreme Court case didn't really start out about whether or not the Cherokee had the right to stay on the land that had been promised to them, but in the end, that's the result, and that's the Wooster versus Georgia case. So in the end, uh, the Wooster versus Georgia case is going to say uh, that the Cherokee Native Americans have a right to stay on their land. And that's very interesting. The Supreme Court of the United States had actually ruled in favor of Native Americans. Why had they done this? Because the United States has signed a, a treaty, a deal, with the Cherokee Nation saying that they could have basically northern Georgia. And so that deal was on paper, and the Supreme Court is going to rule that the United States has to honor treaties. However, Andrew Jackson at this point is going to take the state's routes route or state's rights route, and he is going to say, well, the state of Georgia wants to get rid of these Native Americans. In fact, the majority of white Americans want to get rid of the Native Americans. The majority of Americans, right or wrong, agree with the Indian Removal Act. So what is Andrew Jackson going to do in reaction to this ruling? He is going to simply ignore it. This is the only time in American history where the President of the United States has directly and blatantly violated a ruling of the Supreme Court. So the Cherokee even went through the American legal system. They went through the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's going to rule in favor of them. Andrew Jackson doesn't care. He basically knows that so many Americans are in favor of Indian removal that he can get away with, with kicking them out of the eastern part of the United States. John Marshall, who I talked about earlier, he is still Chief Justice of the Supreme Court when this ruling is handed down, and there are rumors that Andrew Jackson said, quote, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. In other words, Andrew Jackson is going to say the Supreme Court can say whatever it wants, 
but I have I am the commander in chief of the army. I'm the head of the military, so the Supreme Court can say what it wants, but I have the military. So guess what's going to happen? Whatever I say is going to happen. And again, Andrew Jackson really saw himself as an embodiment of the will of the people, and so he is going to do what the people want, even if it is considered unconstitutional. He violates the Supreme Court. Honestly, he should have been impeached and kicked out of office for this, but he's not, because what he was doing was so popular that no one even really seriously talked about impeaching him over this. So after he leaves office... Uh, the Cherokee are going to resist this for several years, but eventually they are mostly going to be rounded up, and they are going to be forced to do a 800-mile walk to what is now Oklahoma. And this happens to take place dur during one of the harsher winters in American history, and I think it was around, it was between eight and 12,000, I think closer to 12,000, that are going to be sent on foot largely or on horseback, and about 4,000 of them die, including the elderly, including uh, women and children, of malnutrition, starvation, disease, and when the winter hits, the cold. So even though technically Andrew Jackson's not present when this occurs, it is his fault that it does occur. Now, some of the Cherokee were able to hide out in the Appalachian Mountains, and there are there is uh, still a Native American reservation today for the Ch the Cherokee. So basically there's an eastern band of the Cherokee Nation that lives in the western part of North Carolina area. And then you have a western band of the Cherokee and those are those that are the descendants of those that survived the very infamous Trail of Tears, where the United States government authorized a forced march of Native Americans after a Supreme Court ruling had ruled in favor of them and Around a third to a half of them died along the way. And Andrew Jackson gets the blame for this. Now the future implications of this is that, uh, one, uh, that the Native American, well let me show you the, the, uh, the map first. So you can see how a lot of Native American groups are going to go in earlier years. Well, actually, this doesn't have, well, it does have dates. So you see the Choctaw, for example, they move out fairly early on. The Chickasaw move out a couple years later. The Creek are going to move out. Some of the Seminole manage to hide in the swamps of Florida. But you'll see that the Cherokee, their movement, some of them move earlier on, 1835, but it's those that move in 1838, those are the ones that would be considered a uh, part of the infamous Trail of Tears where the winter sets in. And again, they are forced to march all the way from this area of the map all the way about 800 miles to what became known as Indian Territory, which is in mostly in modern-day Oklahoma. By the way, they're promised that they can have this land, even though they're not familiar with this land at all. And they do get to keep this land for about 50 years, but eventually the United States will take that land from them too, which is typical. Yet again, an agreement's been made, uh, this one forced upon the Native Americans, but eventually the United States government will take that land away as well. Now, let me rewind, let me show you this territory again. Remember that this is, that I'm circling here, this is basically the Great Plains area. This is where the Native Americans are going to be forced. Well, remember the Native Americans have been forced westward before. They were forced to be on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains at one point. Uh, with uh, the proclamation of 1763, they were forced to be on one side of the Tria Greenville line. Now they're being forced all the way west of the Mississippi River. Keep in mind that the Native Americans are always being forced out west. Well, eventually there's going to be nowhere else to force them. And at that point, the United States government is going to start forcing the Native Americans onto reservations, which is basically the table scraps of land that the American government doesn't want anymore, and the Native Americans are going to be sick of being pushed around. They're really going to hate being put on reservations because, again, uh, they are being given the areas of land that no one else wants, and eventually they will fight back largely to stay off of these reservations, and that will be known as the Plains Indians Wars. Sometimes shortened as the Indian Wars, but more properly, I think, it would be the Plains Indians Wars because this took place largely on the Great Plains in the United States. When does this happen? Pretty much right after the Civil War ends. 
After the Civil War ends, the issue of slavery in the West will no longer be an issue because slavery will be done. And uh, the Transcontinental Railroad and other Transcontinental Railroads will be built. And so Americans are going to flood out West. And that will lead to the final conflict on the Western frontier in the years and decades after the Civil War, again known as the Plains Indians Wars. Okay, so that's pretty much Andrew Jackson's first term. You've seen him be tough when it comes to South Carolina. You've seen him be brutal when it comes to Native Americans. Now let's talk about his second term as president. The second term, there's going to be one major issue, and that is going to be the Bank of the United States. The two candidates will be the Democrats will renominate or they'll nominate uh to renominate Andrew Jackson to be president. He was very popular at this point. You'll see he's even more popular now. The Whigs are going to nominate Henry Clay. And the Whigs were a big fan of his American system proposals. He was popular with uh, a lot of Northerners, uh, even though he was a Westerner himself. And what Henry Clay does is a big miscalculation. Uh, and again, this is his second time running for president against Andrew Jackson. Henry Clay is going to make a big deal out of the Bank of the United States. He's going to say the Bank of the United States has an expiration date. It's not till 1836, four years from now, but let's go ahead and renew it now. And Henry Clay thought that a lot of the country would be uh, on his side on this, but he was wrong about this. He wanted to keep the Bank of the United States. He thought it was essential to building the new American economy that was growing during this first Industrial Revolution. Uh, however, Andrew Jackson distrusted the Bank of the United States. He thought it was unconstitutional, even though the Supreme Court had allowed for it in McCulloch versus Maryland. And the part of the country that was really anti-Bank of the United States was the western part of the country. There, uh, I'm going to condense this, but basically there had been an economic recession uh, during the era of good feelings, where the Bank of the United States had taken some action that really hurt Western farmers and the, just the people in the West in general. So uh, the people of the West really didn't like the Bank of the United States because they felt like it had basically hurt them in what was known as the Panic of 1819. And the people of the South did not like the Bank of the United States largely because they thought it was unconstitutional. So what Andrew Jackson does is he is going to attack the Bank of the United States. He says, if you elect me again, I will kill the Bank of the United States. He basically declares war on the bus or on the Bank of the United States, again, sometimes called the uh, National Bank. He wins very easily. You will notice that he does not win South Carolina. South Carolina, his home state, didn't like him too much after the nullification crisis, and so they elect a separate Democrat to run instead of Andrew Jackson. And some of you may wonder, why does the western state of Kentucky, the west not liking the Bank of the United States, why do they vote for Clay? Well, Clay was the home state, or, or, or Kentucky was the home state of Henry Clay. But overall, you can see that Jackson wins, and he wins by an even wider margin. And one reason is because of the Indian Removal Act, constitutional or not, right or not. It was what the people had wanted. And now he's again showing, basically he's shown that if he says he's going to do something, he's actually going to do it. And since he wins and wins by even more this time around, he won by almost 80% of the electoral vote. He feels like if he promised to get rid of the Bank of the United States and the people vote him in, by an even bigger margin than the first time, then that must mean the people are behind his promise to destroy the Bank of the United States. He has what he calls a mandate from the people, and he will do just that. So how does he do this? And if you look at this picture here, you see uh, the Bank of the United States being shown as kind of this monster. And uh, he actually called it the Monster Bank. And so what he does is he's going to take money out of the bank and he's going to start putting it into state banks. So if you want to take out a bank, what do you do? You take the money out of it. Uh, money is like blood for a bank. And if the bank doesn't have blood in its system then it, or money in its system, then it's going to die. And he basically kills the Bank of the United States. And he puts the money into state banks instead, which were nicknamed pet banks. Think of them like, like teacher's pets. 
these were the banks that he favored again because in this case he's going to take the state's rights route. He did not think that the Indian Removal Act would divide the nation, so he went along with the state of Georgia when they wanted to remove the Native Americans. He did not think that this bank war that he had declared would divide the nation, so he's okay with putting money in state banks. And again, remember the nullification crisis he thought would divide the nation. That's why he sided with the federal government in that case. But overall, he did side with states over the federal government overall, at least in the major issues. So here's a question. Was this constitutional? Well, remember in McCulloch versus Maryland, they had not outright said that the Bank of the United States was constitutional, uh, but they had very, uh, very strongly implied that it was co a constitutional institution because they had prevented Maryland from killing the Bank of the United States through taxing it. So Andrew Jackson really is not only the only president to violate the Supreme Court, he actually violates the Supreme Court twice and could have been impeached for this too. Now, when he violates the Supreme Court this case, he does it a little more indirectly than he did with the Indian Removal Act, but he is still defying the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had basically said the Bank of the United States was allowed, and he had gone and killed the Bank of the United States anyway. This will be very popular with the American people for the time being, but what ends up happening is that the country needs the Bank of the United States a whole lot more than it realizes. And by the end of his second term of president, we're on the edge of an economic crisis. The Bank of the United States is no longer there to help regulate the national economy. And basically a month after Jackson leaves office, the economy tanks. More on that in a little bit. By the way, I told you that Andrew Jackson... Had his first vice president had been John C. Calhoun until the, the nullification crisis. His second vice president will be a man named Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren will become the president of the United States to try to carry on Jackson's legacy, and he's going to fail pretty miserably. So more on that in a moment when I get to the Panic of 1837. But let's do a quick evaluation of Andrew Jackson himself. Again, you either loved him or you hated him. The people that saw him as a man of the people said, this guy will do what is ever necessary for fulfilling the will of the people. And Andrew Jackson himself said that I can pretty much do whatever I want if it is the will of the people. I can even violate the Supreme Court if it is the will of the people. If the people want the Native Americans gone, I'll remove them. If the people want the Bank of the United States gone, I'll kill the Bank of the United States. If the Constitution doesn't say that I can do it, well, the will of the people goes over the Constitution. If you look at this cartoon here, you can see that this cartoonist is a critic of Andrew Jackson because here he is standing on a shredded up copy of the Constitution and he's dressed like a king, like a dictator. So other people looked at him as a dictator. They said that, sure, he's doing what the will of the people are now, but what happens if he decides to do something like a dictator, and he just claims that it's the will of the people, but it's really what he wants to do instead? In other words, if he sets the precedent that he can violate the Constitution even when it's popular, then maybe someday he'll try to violate the Constitution because it's what he wants to do. So a lot of people said this guy is a dictator in the making. And honestly, if nothing else, what Andrew Jackson does is he by far strengthens the power of the executive branch. He strengthens the power of the presidency. This was the most powerful president ever seen in American history up till this point. Could he have become a dictator had he run for a third term? It's hard to say. By the time he was up for running for a third term, which was again legal but not customary at the time, he was getting older, his health was in decline, and he decides not to run for a third term. So again, Jackson, like him or hate him, was very influential whether he did what was right or what was wrong, again, was very influential and, if nothing else, strengthened the power of the presidency. Whether a good thing or a bad thing, uh, he does strengthen the power of the presidency. I will tell you that the Founding Fathers intended for Congress to be the strongest of the three branches. Andrew Jackson, basically Andrew Jackson does to the presidency 
with his actions what the Supreme Court had done through the Marbury versus Madison case. He kind of asserts the power of his branch of government. Did he go too far? That's up for debate. And uh, with that, I will move on from Andrew Jackson. Now, as soon as he leaves office, the next president comes in. Uh, Andrew Jackson is going to say to the American people, if you like me, you're going to love Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren takes office. People think it's going to be a continuation of Democrat rule. Remember, Jackson and Martin Van Buren were Democrats. They think that things are going to continue to go along like they did under Jackson's presidency, where the will of the people, especially the common man, gets uh, its way. Well, um, literally a month into Martin Van Buren's presidency, there's going to be an economic panic, which is basically a quick recession, and that is known as the Panic of 1837. Now, what ends up happening is that if the economy is good, the president gets credit. If the economy is bad, the president gets blamed. And so people are going to blame the new president, Martin Van Buren, who was carrying on Andrew Jackson's economic policies, like the killing of the Bank of the United States. And so Martin Van Buren and his party, and remember the party of Jackson and the party of Martin Van Buren was the Democrat Party, People are going to blame the Democrats. So much so that they are going to be willing by the next election to give the Whig Party a shot. Now, if you want to get your candidate elected president, one thing that you might do is elect a war hero. Again, the Democrats had done that with Andrew Jackson. Look at George Washington. He was a war hero as well. And so what the Whig Party is going to do is they are going to say, let's capitalize on the Democrats losing their popularity. Let's capitalize on the fact that they're getting blamed for this panic. But let's also learn from their tactics. Let's run a war hero. Let's make sure that our war hero comes off as a common man, as an average person, even if he's not. So that brings up the election of 1840. In the election of 1840, some people are starting to favor the Whig Party. And the two candidates are going to be William Henry Harrison, the other hero here, I'm circling, from the War of 1812. Remember, he was the one that had defeated Native American resistance at the Battle of Tippecanoe. In fact, his uh, nickname was Old Tippecanoe. His running mate is going to be a man named John Tyler. The main reason I mentioned John Tyler is because he's going to become the president pretty soon after Harrison, because Harrison's going to die one month into office. More on that later on. So those are your candidates. And they are going to use Jackson-style campaigning. For example, they are going to use a catchy slogan. Tip a canoe and Tyler too. It rolls off the tongue. So again, this will be catchy. This will be something that kind of rhymes and it's going to get the attention of people. And again, think about more recent elections. If you have a catchy slogan like hope and change with the Obama presidency or make America great again, which both uh, President Trump and President Ronald Reagan used. Uh, if you have a catchy slogan that really helps you get elected, superficial or not, it gets people elected and both parties do this. So tip a canoe and Tyler too will be the catchy way to campaign. Again, another way to campaign is to make yourself seem average, make yourself seem like the common man. And Henry, uh, William Henry Harrison was not a common man. He was wealthy. He had a mansion. I think he might have even had multiple mansions, but they don't emphasize that. So what ends up happening is they run what's known as the log cabin and hard cider campaign. Whenever they go campaigning, they literally have little model log cabins that they roll around in the streets to emphasize this idea that uh, Harrison and maybe Tyler live in a log cabin like your average common man. They also, at their campaign rallies, literally are passing out hard cider, which is alcoholic uh, cider. And uh, this was the drink that was favored by the common man. Common, the common man tended to be your poor farmer. Uh, and a lot of your poor farmers, they kept barrels of apples outside of their homes. And when the apples fermented, it became alcoholic cider. Uh, so basically, uh, the log cabin and hard cider campaign appeals to the common man. This is kind of like if, a, if today, if a candidate ran for office and they were rolling around maybe double-wide trailers and passing out 
uh, Budweiser. These would be things that your more common uh, Americans would be able to relate to, and it would definitely get a lot of votes. Again, imagine today if a political candidate was handing out beer uh, to, to people that could vote that were over age 21, that would get a lot more votes than it should because it appeals to common uh, to the common man. It's a very appealing campaign tactic. Well, this is literally what happened in 1840. Rolling around little mini heart, uh, little uh, log cabins to make yourself seem common and passing out uh, free alcohol, the kind of alcohol that the common man would drink, which would be hard cider. They were not passing out wine. They were not passing out champagne. They're passing out a more common beverage, hard cider. So do they win? Yeah, they win. Uh, and they win the electoral vote actually pretty easily. You'll notice that they won 80%. They actually won more uh, electoral votes in terms of percentage than Jackson did during either one of his two terms. So what ends up happening is they win easily, but then when William Henry Harrison gets sworn in at his inauguration, he decides to break one record that leads to him breaking a second record. The first record he breaks is that he gives the longest inaugural address in American history. It was sleeting outside. However, he decides to make an hour and a half long speech. He ends up getting sick and... Uh, he, so he, he, his first record is the longest inauguration speech. His second record is he serves as president shorter than anyone in American history. He dies a month later. John Tyler becomes president. And I don't really have much of anything to say in this class about John Tyler, except for the fact that uh, right after John Tyler comes a very influential president, James K. Polk. James K. Polk, look out for him. He is going to gain the United States more land than any other president than Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and he will be known as the expansion president. He is from North Carolina. So he'll come in after John Tyler, and he is going to increase the size of the nation dramatically. So keep that in mind. Polk is coming along later on. But right now, I don't have a lot to say about presidents. So the uh, majority of the rest of this unit will be about what's going on with the common man and with common women. And you're, you're not going to hear so much about politicians as you will about life for more everyday Americans and the issues that they face. And that will be uh, the rest of this unit until I get to the election of James K. Polk.